Hey guys, Harrison, one of my get it once again for a brand new video for you, and welcome to episode, I think, 13 now. It's been a little while since I've done one of these. Uh, for Moto 4, that's a GP14 career mode, let's play. Um, you may have already seen the news on, um, on my page, um, on my, my pages on social media, Facebook and Twitter, but, um, today is my third birthday, technically speaking. The first video I uploaded on this channel was on September the 1st, 2011. Today is my third anniversary of being on YouTube in this current form, and I'd just like to say thank you for all the support, um, as always, um... In three years, we've made over 440 videos, gained over 5,260 subscribers, and over 1.1 million video views. I don't think I've done too bad <laughs> in that time. We could do a lot better, but I think we've done. We've done I think we've done all right. So, seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for all the support. Whether it's been for three years or three days, you're a part of this, and for that, I'm truly grateful. So, thank you all so much. Um. I didn't really have anything special planned because I almost forgot about this entirely until a couple of days ago. I was suddenly looked at it and was like, wait, isn't September the 1st kind of special for something? And then I looked it up and then I was like, oh, shoot, okay. <coughs> Pardon me. So, yeah, without further ado, let's celebrate with a little MotoGP, shall we? We've got a lot to talk about in this one. Um, so, let's get right down to it. Last time we left you, we had just done Mugello where we picked up, we picked up our fourth win of the season. And in fact, third consecutive on the bounce, and we're now going to head off to the. We actually chose to head to the Pons team, the Pons HP40 team. Even even though I know they're sponsored by someone else now, and they're now in yellow rather than white. Maybe they should maybe they should ought to update that. But and I've joined up with the other two young studs in the in the category, uh, Maverick Vinales, the as I like to call him Maverick, Return of the Mac Vinales, and Louis Salom, um, who's kind of shit in the bed this year, to be honest, but. You know, let's see what happens. Maverick's got a more, some, almost maximum rider skill bar, and Salom's not too far behind either. But the bike itself isn't the maximum. And as you can see, we are dead level in the championship between me and Tito Rabat. Um, with Mika Calio a further nine points back. So, because of this, because I'm now on a top level bike, I'm up in the difficulty from medium to hard. We'll see how that works out. Um, I think now's the time I really up the difficulty. Now I'm a little bit more used to the game. As we head to Catalonia for round seven. Um, but yeah, we got so much to talk about. I've not done a, I've not done an episode in, in like two weeks at least now. I think, and in that time we missed Bruno and um, and uh, Silverstone as well. Not much to really talk about from Bruno to be honest, because Bruno was kind of straightforward. Besides the Moto Free race. Um, the thing is with, with Moto with Moto with Moto GP was obviously the big one from Renault was Marquez didn't win. Uh, Marquez seemed to have a wheel spin problem and you know um, dealing with acceleration out of the corners um, throughout the race and as a result finished in fourth. Pedrosa got his 26th Grand Prix win, um, 26 for number 26 you could say, um, with Lorenzo close behind in second and Valentino Rossi who I think is is seventh at the time a podium of the season. Uh, Moto2, Rabat had a very straightforward, dominant win over Mika Calio in second. And uh, who was in third? Well, yeah, it was Sandro Cortese with his best Moto2 sorry, finish to date in third. Sam Lowe's had a shot at a podium for Great Britain there, but unfortunately fell off the bike when he was in third place. Great. Um, and in Moto3, absolute pandemonium as we had literally 16 bikes contending for a Grand Prix. And Alex Rins... Headline in favourite to win that race. Oh, it's raining. Um, headline in favourite to win that race until he got up and started celebrating with a lap to go, thinking the race was already over. Whoops. Um, so as a result, uh, so as a result, uh, he ended up finishing in ninth when he probably had a really good shot at winning. Um, whoops. Okay. Um, what do I do on upgrades here? Let's. Let's do the brakes, shall we? I like having good brakes. So I swear it's something the AI is actually quite weak on. But yeah, we had like it was I think it was Guevara who came in 16th place. He was 1.9 seconds away from the win and did not score a point. Crazy. 
But let's see how this hard difficulty stacks up first. Six laps of Catalonia in the rain. Should be interesting. As we pass Cito Pons. Um, Axel Pons, I should say. Sorry, his son. Cito's son, I should say. Baldessari back on his Grissini bike. Whoa! And now goes Nakagami. Well, the first time I've said that this year. Whoa, whoa. Very wide. Yeah, not a lot of grip on these corners because of the rain, obviously. And also, I'm still kind of resting because it's been about a couple of weeks since I last played this game, so hopefully I'll get back in the groove of things pretty soon. Also, I'm going to be kind of because like, the acceleration out of the corners on this bike is immense. I've got, I've got to be careful with it. Um, but yeah, let's talk a lot about Silverstone, shall we? Top to bottom, Silverstone may have been the best weekend I've ever seen as a MotoGP fan. It was incredible. All three races kicked ass. And, and, and that's rare. Very, very rare where all three races in the class were fantastic. And they saved the best till last with Moto3. That was, a, that was a classic. Fantastic race. Absolutely to the wire. But let's start in the top class where we had kind of a rematch from last year at Silverstone. It was Lorenzo versus Marquez the whole race. Pretty much. They were in a class of their own compared to the rest of the field. Pedrosa, Rossi and, and Davizioso were in their own separate fight for third, about eight seconds down the road in the end. But yeah, like I said, it was just, it was it was Lorenzo V. Marquez and the, you know, the, the class of the field um, at it again. Lorenzo is very strong at Silverstone. He's only failed to win there once in his MotoGP career to date. He is very, very strong. Um, he's, he's very, very strong around there. So, um, it was a big surprise when Marquez, well, not really a big surprise, when Marquez got his 11th win of the season. Um, so, you know, right back on form after the, after the, what happened at Bruno. It seems to be that Bruno was just a blip and it was more of a setup problem than anything else that caused the issues. As we try and go down the inside of the Angelus, who's now in MotoGP with, with the forward team. Now Colin's gone. But, um, also, I've got to give him, I mean, Marquez, Marquez won the race with a, with a aggressive, but I think it was a very hard but fair move on Lorenzo with two laps to go. So people wanting, want people again wanting to call MotoGP boring when Marquez wins all the time. Well, you had a pretty much a back and forth, rough and tumble race to the finish. So I say, haha, maybe not. Um, and ironically, I, I talk about Renault, the one race where Marquez wasn't up the front was, was probably the most boring MotoGP race of the season. Funny that. Um, good, nice run on the Andalus there. Yes, into 11th place, but a bit too late on the brakes there. The Andalus gets me back. Oh dear. But uh, yeah, like I said, you know, it, it. I think Marquez always had the apex going into that corner, and the one before the uh, Wellington straight. Um, he always had the corner, and two into one doesn't go. And I think Marquez had the move the whole way through. Um, it, it forced Lorenzo to sit up and he lost about four tenths of a second doing that and that pretty much cost him the win in the end because Marquez is mad clutch on the last lap and he doesn't make mistakes on the last lap of a race very much at all, if ever. Um, so, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, it was, it, it was a hard but... A, a fair move, as, as uh, Julian Ryder quite rightly pointed out, in my opinion. Got to give props to Andrea De Vizioso, though. He was my rider of the day. Dovi and that Ducati, they're clearly making some headway here. As soon as he get the move on Volga here, into 10th place. But, let's still concentrate a little bit here. Volga's going back the long way around, but I'll shut him off there. But like I said, you know, it was, it was, it was amazing to see Dovi up there actually looking competitive again. Like, have Ducati finally found something here on their bikes, or was it just just a one-off because the tire wear wasn't that bad around Silverstone? I don't know which one it was, but whatever it was, it was just fantastic to see him up there again, and Ducati as a team up there again. Because you know, having it just being Honda versus Yamaha gets a bit boring, you know, now and again, and. 
you know, Davizioso is no Casey Stoner. But it was fan only nine seconds off the win and was fighting with Rossi and Pedrosa for a podium the entire Grand Prix until the final lap where, you know, Rossi put it on Pedrosa right at the death and that's what worked out in the end. Um, but great to see Dovi in there, a, a very well-earned fifth place and could have easily been a podium on another day. Um, and it just, it, I, I've said it before, Davizioso deserves more props for what he does. Um... He has proven he is a very, very good rider that can constantly get results on all three major manufacturers. He's done it with Tech 3 in the Yamaha, he's done it with Repsol Honda in the factory team for Honda, and he's now doing it on a Ducati as well. Um, I think that's the fourth time he's finished in the top five this season. So just overall, a brilliant, brilliant job from Dovi. Um, he's almost, I would say, in that top fourth category with, you know, Marquez, Pedrosa, Lorenzo, Rossi. Um... And just a overall incredibly talented rider. I'll try and get a move on Xavier Simeon here. Looks like we're going about the same pace here as the other guys in the midfield here. But yeah, that was MotoGP in a nutshell. Great to see Scott Redding in the top 10 again. Um, tenth place for Redding, fantastic finish in an out-qualified Bautista in both Q1 and Q2. Um, Redding is, is can do no more on that customer Honda. I'm going to talk a lot more about Redding in a minute, but man, he is doing an outstanding job at the moment with that customer Honda, and he will get better next year. Um, it looks like he'll be getting a factory bike, but I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. Overshot that corner. Whoops. Badly overshot that corner. Oh, I'm wheeling in a Moto2 bike. How about that? Um, Crutchlow was really struggling out there. Bradley Smith was looking good for a top eight finish again, but unfortunately he uh, had a cracked wheel, I think it was, he said in the post-race interview. Um, the British fans are really turning out in support for him, and it's a real shame that a mechanical problem ended his race. Um, especially when his partner, the Polis Bagaro, came in sixth again. So, you know, the, the whispers will be talking again about, you know, our oh, Poles so much better than Bradley and blah, 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 blah. Even though it was really unfair on Bradley in this one and had a good chance of finishing ahead of him um, in the end. But uh, overall, a, a, a very, very good MotoGP race. Again, battles all through the field from top to bottom. Very good to see. Um, God, Cortese is two seconds down the road. That's not good. This, God, this bike's good on the brakes. But yeah, let's talk about Moto2 a little bit as well. And in Moto2, we had a very, very um, top-to-bottom race from start to finish. It was very interesting because Calio got the early advantage, despite Zarco's pole. Um... Calio broke off a bit of an advantage after, you know, guys like Zarco, Rabat, and Vinales was up there, Volga was up there, Corsi was up there. They were all fighting for position, but Calio broke off an advantage, but in the second half of the race, Rabat got to the front of the pack, and Rabat started chasing Calio down, and Rabat put in a couple of monster laps, and as a result of that, as a, as a, as a result of that, I was going wheel to wheel with Simeon, with, with Simeon here. Um, as a result of that, you know, Rabat chased Calio down and had a great scrap with him all the way to the line, but it was Rabat that got his sixth win of the season. Um, and that, I think, was the best ride of Tito's career. Came through the pack, um, dealt with all the drama of all these bikes around him, like Vinales, Zarco, Volga, Corsi, etc. Um... Dealt with it very, very well. Got the pace down. Set the fastest lap of the Grand Prix with like four laps to go, which was ridiculous. Got to the back of Calio, out-muscled him, and won. And, you know, Vinales was right there in third again. Vinales, another brilliant performance from Maverick. Uh, he's more than ready for the top class, in my opinion. He is the best of the rest, uh, outside of the guys on the VDS bikes. And I think that's more than obvious at this point. Uh, as he leads the race right now, actually, funnily enough. Um, Tom Lutie up there in third. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Um, 
Shame about Agatha not making it. He crashed on lap one, even though he got a monster start from 19th. Um, kept going and was apparently was lapping the same pace as the leaders um, after the crash, which just, just, just makes it all the more unfortunate because Agatha is very, very good. We all know that. Anyone who watches Moto 2 knows that Agatha is one of the best guys in the field and probably deserves a top a top end seat, but isn't going to get it more than likely because Dorna are very high on Johan Zarco. They want a French rider in the top class, you know, for marketing purposes. So Zarco apparently is getting a lot of interest. And Zarco, I think, is a very good rider. I just don't think he's in that same it's that same tier as Vinales, you know, or Agatha, for example, or even Corsi, um, for instance. Which is kind of a shame, to be honest. Um, also, speaking of Corsi, no shame was with, with him with Volga pretty much uh, low sided it going into the um, going into a, a hairpin bend, and as a result, he took he collected Corsi underneath him. It was similar to when Rossi did it to Casey Stoner at, at her F a couple of years ago. Um, and as a result, Corsi apparently broke his arm, uh, and now it looks like he'll be out for about two races, which is really unfortunate that Volga's done goof. Uh, <laughs> um, has put Corsi on the shelf for a month, which is a shame, really, because Corsi's a very, very good rider. Um, trying my best to catch up here to the, the, this next pack, and I'm starting to get the bike down now at last, but it's like I've left it too late. Like Vinales got the win over Rabat in the end. It's good to see. My teammate doing so well. But yeah, I wasn't I wasn't too keen on the bike in the rain around here. I'm not sure if the diff if it was a difficulty thing, whether it was just the fact I'm generally rusty or whatever. But that was not good in terms of the championship. Um, ninth place, the final result. Rabat coming in second isn't helpful. So he's now got a 13 point lead in the championship again. Um, Calio's only three points behind me now as well. But, uh, there we go. Talking about Moto3 now as well. My god, another thriller. We had 16 bikes in contention for about 80% of the race. Um, carnage all over the place. Passes everywhere. Slipstream battles taking place all over the place. Silverstone is such a fast track in, most, in, in, in bike racing terms that you can slipstream on the smaller bikes everywhere, which made passing and all that just insane. So, you know, as a result, we had all kinds of crazy shenanigans all up through the field. Eventually, eventually a top four broke out, and the top four was, it was Enna Bastianini, the 16-year-old, it was going off to Assen next, which should be very, very good, because I love Assen in this game. Um... It was, the top four was Enna Bastianini, the two uh, Galicia bikes of Alex Rins and Alex Marquez, and Miguel Oliveira, the Portuguese on the Mahindra, um, which was a bit of a surprise to see him that far up the field. But those four broke out, and eventually it was just one-tenth of a second that covered them all over the line. But it was Alex Rins who took the long way around the final corner with Marquez digging in on the inside, getting a brilliant draft out of that last turn. Um, but Rins won by 30, it was actually, it was 11 thousandths of a second, which is about four inches, roughly. Um, the width of a tyre, I would say, compared to that and the whim, uh, the rim over, over Marquez, who came in second. Enna Bastianini with a very, very impressive performance in third, and Miguel Oliveira in fourth. Apparently Oliveira might be on the way to Red Bull KTM next year, because I think KTM have kind of already admitted that Jack Miller's on the way out. It looks like Miller's going to going straight to MotoGP next year on an open class LCR Honda. Um, a production Honda. The same bike that Scott Redding's on right now, in case you're curious about that. Um, so, it looks like Red Bull KTM are going to bring in... Um, who is it now? They're going to bring in Miguel Rivera and Brad Binder. I'm, I'm hearing that the two guys they're going to bring in to replace them. And Red Bull KTM are going to run three bikes next year alongside Carol Hanneker, the, um, the 2013 Red Bull Rookies champion. Uh, so that, again, that's a solid team, but I think that's a lot of mediocre there. I don't see any elite guys standing out. But the, the good thing about that, though, is that it looks like... It looks like the top three in the championship are probably all going to move up next year. Which I guess is kind of a blessing in disguise. Um, 
Mainly because... By the looks of it, it looks like... Alex Marquez is going to mark VD. Actually, it was confirmed today that Alex Marquez is moving up to Moto2 next year and joining the Mark VDS team. Um, so it looks like Mark VDS are going to run free bikes next year or they're cutting Calio. I don't think they're going to cut Calio because he's very solid and experienced and a good guy to have in a team. So I don't see why they'd ever get rid of, of Calio, um, to be honest. Oh, it's like so much nicer now, it's dry. Yes, good start, up to the 19th. Go, 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 go get past Nico to roll. He wasn't at Silverstone this weekend. Uh, apparently he's got a bit of a, uh, apparently because he's lactose intolerant from what I've heard is that he's been a bit ill as a result of that. And they had to, they brought in a, uh, Mamola's son, Randy Mamola's son. I think it's, uh, I can't remember his name, it's, uh, his first name, but I know it was uh, Randy Mamola's son who filled in with the, for the weekend. Didn't, didn't quite see him up there, unfortunately, but uh, that's a shame. Ne next up on the list is Jordi Torres. As I, as I like to call him, Mr. Sideways Glance. If you ever subscribe to MotoGP's YouTube channel, like, Jordi Torres always does something funny. Like, this race, he, I remember he put an L plate on the back of Mamola's helmet, which I thought was hilarious. Um, on the Aspar team there, so always a fun laugh, Jordi Torres, one of the funniest guys in motorsport for sure. Torres is hilarious. But yeah, let's talk about Alex Marquez. I, I mean, it's it's also strongly hinted that uh, it, it looks like on the way up could also be Alex Rins from the Galicia team as well, because. I'm hearing strong rumours that Alex Rins is going to the Pons team next year. So Pons might run free bikes next year as well, unless Luis Salom gets moved on, or unless Maverick Vinales goes to Suzuki, which is becoming, again, increasingly likely. So if Vinales comes out, it'll be Salom and Alex Rins next year. The, ironically, the, you know, the two guys that didn't win the Moto3 Championship last year, while well, the guy who did could very well be in MotoGP next year at the age of 20. Crazy. Whoa, coming at the inside of Thomas Luti. Luti's a very defensive dude, so it's hard to pass, so that was quite good. What's Cortese doing in third anyway? Also, about my gear in now, it's so it's so short now, it tops out literally right there, which is perfect. A little bit on the grassy side. No, Luti! <laughs> But, you know, my, I'll tell you right now for a fun fact, and I know we've had my brother on this show before, he is a huge Alex Marquez advocate, and I don't blame him because the kid's got tremendous upside. I mean, when Mark Marquez says that Alex Marquez was a better rider than me at 19 than I was, that's saying something, especially given that Alex Marquez, um, or Mark Marquez at 19, was dominating the Moto2 World Championship. I'm probably doing that, actually. Want to talk about Alex Marquez on the air? <laughs> No? Uh, Love to talk about he's a god. <laughs> Ryan, the mic's down here, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can hear my ego. Yo, we can hear that from space. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Shut up, Ryan. <laughs> but, you know, he, he is, I mean, there's a lot of people saying there's a possibility that Marquez could eventually be in that Repsol team alongside his brother Mark as an all Marquez unit one day. There's definitely a possibility of this, I would say. Let's get to the Mark VDS boys up the front here. Rabat, Rabat and Calio. <laughs> but um, I definitely see the possibility being there one day of, of a Mark, Alex, brother, Repsol, Honda team because Pedrosa's extension only lasts two years and, and, Hon and Pedrosa is a guy which... While I still think is a very, very good rider, could easily be cut for somebody else who's younger, fresher, and a lot more exciting. Like, Pedrosa was the safe pick when it came to his contract being re-signed. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie about this. If it were me, I might give someone like Alicia Spagaro a chance. Or maybe even Scott Redding, which I'll talk about again in a little bit. But there's definitely possibilities about that too. Um, 
But, you know, that's a very, very good signing for Mark VDS. Alex Marquez is going to be a stud, I'm sure of it. He's a brilliant rider. That Rufia gang camp of Rabat Mark and the two Marquez brothers are very good overall. So I'm very excited to see what they can do um, in, under, 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 under the same unit next year. Because we already know Rabat is staying next year for Mark VDS. It's a matter of do they run three bikes and keep Calio or do they move Calio on and they only run two. It's not like Formula 1 where the bikes are so much more expensive. So, you know, they can afford to run three. Speaking of Mark VDS, there also, there's also still a possibility they could be in MotoGP next year. Uh, the talk's been ongoing. Um, and it's to do with Scott Redding. Um, and Grassini. Because Grassini, the team that sponsors Scott Redding, and the team that also hold Avara Bautista, looks like they can no longer afford to run the factory Honda bike that they have. And as a result, it looks like Rossini are going to be running Aprilia's next year. They're going to hold the official Aprilia team who are coming back to MotoGP probably in 2015. Um, they definitely going to be back in by 2016, they say, but it's looking more and more likely that they're going to move up next season instead. Hooray! Um, and their team will most likely be Alvaro Bautista, um, who's had not the best of years, to be honest. He's had a 50% drop rate this year in 12 rounds. Six crashes in 12 rounds is... Not ideal, but um, there's talk he might get the bump up there with Aprilia with Marco Melandri, who you may remember from a few years ago in MotoGP. So he's kind of made a bit of a name for himself in World Superbikes now, and it's looking he's going to be coming back. That means there's a factory Honda available to somebody, and there's a couple of teams right now fighting it out for that one remaining factory Honda. LCR apparently are thinking about it, but they may not be able to afford it. But the teams that are most interested right now are Aspar, um, the guys that have Nikki Hayden and Hiroshi Ayama at the moment, and also the Mark VDS camp, who are always thinking about a MotoGP switch but never really had the funds. Maybe now they do. Um, not sure if they can handle having three Moto2 bikes in their name, MotoGP team as well. So that's going to be quite the hodgepodge. If they can afford it, great. I'd love to see Mark VDS in the top class. And basically... What sweetens the deal here is that basically Scott Redding comes with the bike. <laughs> and everybody right now is very, very high on Scott Redding. Um, it's the, you know, he is the top production Honda right now by a mile. He's de she destroyed both Aspars at Silverstone this past weekend. Um, of obviously Leon Camia, who is obviously standing in, so you know, you've know got to give him a bit of a pass there. And Hiroshi Ayama, who has never really gone anywhere in his top class career. But Basically, let's put it to you this way. The deal of, oh, so take our factory Honda, oh, and bring Scott Redding with you is a bit like saying, hmm, you know what? Yes, you can have sex with Miller Kunis, but as long as you throw in Jennifer Lawrence at the same time. <laughs> that, like, there's no downside because everybody likes Scott Redding. Everybody thinks he's a very, very good rider. He probably should have been Moto2 World Champion last season if it weren't for that Fida Pyland injury he, he, he sustained. Whoops. Um... And we all know what, what his adversary, Polar Spagro, is doing right now at Tech 3, which is very solid work. So in theory, Scott should be right up there as well on a factory Honda. So it's a package deal. It's it's like buy one, get one free. Get a really great bike and then get Scott Redding on top of it. It's brilliant. <laughs> like, like, there's no downside here. Because Scott Redding would be a blatant upgrade on Hiroshi Ayama. <laughs> if, if you're Aspar and if you're VDS, you've, you've got a guy that's already ridden for you in the past who you know, the team knows well, they know what he likes, setup-wise. It's it's, it would be a dream deal for Mark VDS, in my opinion. They, sh they should be biting Honda's hand off, because Honda are very high on Redding. In fact, Honda are high on a lot of dudes at the moment. Like, Honda have got their eyes on, you know, Alex Marquez, who's in that Repsol camp very, very often. Um, he's in that camp a lot. They've got their eye on Jack Miller, who is going straight to MotoGP next year by the looks of it with LCR. And they've got their eyes on Scott Redding, who looks every bit as good as Paul Spagaro does and looks like he could be a very serious contender in a, in a few years' time. And he's still only 21 years old. He's a year younger than me. That puts, that puts me in perspective. Um, <laughs> but, you know... Redding is a guy that has won Moto2 Grand Prix before. His Ven is very, very good. So, Honda have got a lot of guys they could have riding for them in the future. 
Maybe they should go back to running three bikes again and have maybe a team. Imagine a team of the two Marquez brothers and Scott Redding. All like 22, 21, 23 years old. That kind of age range. What kind of friggin' dynasty would that be? <laughs> You'd have three automatic title contenders right off the bat. Uh, and I know Yamaha are high on pole to Spagro, but I don't really see anyone else coming up with that Yamaha courting kind of in range. Because if you look at the Yamaha dudes, there's not a lot of guys out there. Like, they have pole to Spagro locked down. But who else? Like, I don't see anyone else being associated with Yamaha seats at the moment. Maybe Jonas Volga in the future who is okay in Moto2, but not brilliant by any stretch. You know, they, Bradley Smith, who only just got an extension this year. I think that one was very up in the air for a little while, at least. You know, it's like Honda are, 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 the, are the, you know, the bikes to be and the place to be. I'm, I'm not doubting that Honda have the best bike. I mean, they've beaten Yamaha 12-0 this year. That, that says it all, really, when it was 9-9 last year, so... Who knows? There's a lot of talk going on at the moment. It's an exciting time to be a bike fan, because as a British bike fan as well, because Scott Redding might be the best MotoGP rider we've ever had in terms of pure talent. And with Crutchlow going to LCR next year, we're going to have all three main British riders, Bradders, um, Redding and Crutchlow, all on satellite level bikes next year, which should be fantastic. It's the, uh, the future is definitely bright, I would say, when it comes to the Brits. Um, maybe not so much Bradley, but definitely Scott Redding, for sure. He's, 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 he's like a guy we could pin the mast on, for sure, which is great to see. We, we need a guy like that, because we thought it may have been Crutchlow, but he looks banged up at the moment. I said it before. I said it to my brother on, on during the race weekend. Tell Crutchlow to take the rest of the year off, because he's clearly banged up and hurting at the moment. I mean, he finished, I think, in, uh, in, in 12th place. It's Silverstone behind Redding on a production Honda. Um, maybe take the rest of the year off, bump Andre Iannone up immediately. And, you know, because I remember Redding has also got interest from Pramac. So if if Redding doesn't work out with a decent team, you can go to Pramac Ducati as well and get Iannone's bike, which I don't think would be too bad either. Um, Iannone's done great things with that Ducati this year. So maybe give Iannone the immediate bump up instead um, to the to factory Ducati team alongside Dovi and see what he can really do. That might be better for for all parties in the long run because Cal's clearly dinged up at the moment and he's not riding any, anywhere near his best on a bike which doesn't really fit his riding style. But uh, whew, I've been talking non-stop for the last half hour. Um, I'm loaded, but I'm going to sit down and take a breath. Um, thank you guys for watching. If you've got any opinions and anything you want my two cents on, please let me know. I'd love to hear your comments as always. And thank you very much for watching. I've been Harrison101 and I'll catch you guys next time. Sayonara.